RC Podcast, take three. <laughs> Stop. Again? <laughs> again. This is Brandon. And Jane. <laughs> can say it again like that. This is Brandon. <laughs> In January. <laughs> we are here. We are here. We are here. We're back. We have a really cool topic to talk about today. We do. It's but very exciting. <laughs> but first, <laughs> we have a sponsor to talk about. Yes. A very awesome sponsor. Yeah, I really love them. Uh, Doula Trainings International. And Tara and Gina are just incredible, powerful, thoughtful, successful women behind it. And I respect them a lot. And they are doing a conference called Born Into This. And it is to bring together birth workers, innovators, artists, and makers who are all committed to reproductive and birth justice. Like how rad is that? Pretty rad. <laughs> uh, and the, the thought is, is that by bringing these creative minds together with a shared purpose among birth workers that they'll be tapping into something new. And they're adding guest speakers. They already have quite a few announced. They're adding more. The tickets were supposed to uh, close on, I believe it was March 21st, but they extended it another 30 days. So if you are interested about this Born Into This conference, which I've never seen anything like this before, it's incredibly thought-provoking and inclusive, and it's going to be in Austin, actually. Austin in July, right? Mm -hmm. Austin in July. So if you're interested in more information about it or want to grab tickets, you can go to bornintothis.co. Now, their doula training program is it's amazing. I looked into it myself years ago. They've been at this for quite some time. They are completely dedicated to their doulas, to the doula training, and to the women and families that they doula for. And their program is, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Extensive. Yeah. They think of everything. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to think of. They think of everything and they lead each group together from beginning to end and then into your career as a doula and as a birth worker. So uh, if you want more information about their doula training for birth postpartum as well, you can go to wearedti.com. Wearedti.com. That's it. All right. So we are DTI and born into this. Check them out. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we are going to talk about big family efficiency. Big family efficiency. And this is actually something I think we know a little tiny bit about. Do you? I do. You think we're qualified to speak on this? Just a tad. Maybe. Maybe after 14 years, we're getting a hang of it and a few tips. I mean, we sure don't know everything, but we know a little something about this. We have learned a few things the hard way, mm -hmm. pretty much all the hard way. <laughs> no easy ways. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we do like to learn the hard way, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Well, that's really the only way to get experience, right? And it's also humbling. It's very humbling. Well, I first want to touch on stereotypes in large families. There is that stereotype. When we had our sixth baby beard baby we would go out with her while the other children with the babysitter and people thought she was our only child I don't know what it was but after a while of everyone asking if this was our first baby I started thinking maybe we don't look like typical parents of six children I don't know so I wasn't really sure what stereotypes people were having of us I guess they didn't expect a couple that was put together and in love and a cute baby at, you know, the domain in Austin having dinner at the steeping room. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe they expect us to be at the country buffet. I'm not sure what was going on. But <laughs> uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And there probably is a stereotype around large families. It, it started feeling like people were expecting us to, you know, live on land and grow yeah. our own food and cloth diaper and do all these things. And there's nothing wrong with these things whatsoever. But the stereotype there really made me step back and kind of think because we don't fit into that stereotype or a box or anything. We never have, actually. We've never been good at fitting into any labels or stereotypes. No, no. So we are not your stereotypical if there is one large family. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about that on the rest of the episodes. So I don't, have you noticed that, like any stereotypes one way or the other of what people think when you have a large family? Well, I think a lot of times people that have large families tend to be more religious and we were mm, okay. very religious at one time. Right. You know, we used to be Mormon. So I think there is that stereotype okay. uh, that, that goes with that. I didn't and think about that one. 
Yeah, that that's pretty common. And typically when you have a large family, you know, kids are expensive. And so with that many kids, you want to save as much money as you Absolutely. can. Absolutely. So um, shopping at secondhand stores for clothes and things like that. Uh, obviously, the kids are not going to be wearing designer clothes. And so no. maybe uh, sometimes might look more raggedy than others. I mean, I don't know. Our, our kids have looked raggedy I at times. Other times they've looked really put together. So it's... Being a, a parent of any kids, but especially large families, you know, it can be unfortunately too easy to look and feel exhausted and disheveled oh absolutely right and so that's another common stereotype i think people i think i think that is assume. you know and so uh yeah and as a mom of six children that is a stereotype i definitely don't want to fall into and maybe that's carrying what other people think or maybe that's just carrying what i think and my own expectation but you know you're right our children aren't always in matching clothes like i love to give my children our children creative space to be themselves dress how they like and all that kind of kind of thing so my our kids will not look all matching and six six matching outfits or anything like that but no 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 i do want them all to have on you know a shirt, pants, socks, shoes, you know, like all the Maybe basics. Maybe wear some underwear. Yeah. So, Shower occasionally. Brush their teeth, you yeah. know, before we leave the house and those kind of, you know, those kind of things. So I don't want to fall into, I guess, either or any stereotype or expectations. If my kids are loved and taken care of and clothed and fed and healthy, you know, then that's the goal. And some days they may look more well put together than other days. You know, I took two of the girls out today to the grocery store in the 99 cent store and they were dressed in like what would be considered fine church clothes. So we went the opposite way today. I don't know what they were doing. I was in leggings and a t-shirt, but I was like, I just told them they look so beautiful and let's go. They were going on a date with mom and that's what they wanted to do. So, you know, my oldest, she likes to just throw on yoga pants and a tank top. Let's go, you know, so... Yeah. But there are these stereotypes surrounding large families, and I think there's pressure with, with large families uh, for your children to look more put together because our children are a reflection of us and our parenting. And that expectation and that stereotype is, can be really, really frustrating and nerve-wracking. And many times as, as parents, we care more about what the other adults are thinking than what our children are thinking. And yeah. so there's got to be a little bit of a balance with that, I think. Definitely take care of yourself first and then take care, and take care of your kids. And then if anybody is having an expectation on you guys beyond that, that's their expectation expectation and that's their problem. One other thing I want to address, and this has always kind of chapped my hide, probably for about 10 years uh, since I was working for another chiropractor and I heard him say this. I've heard a few other people that were considered successful say this, but if you want to see the measure of success of a person or how well they carry themselves or put themselves together is take a look at how clean their car is. Mm. And when you are single or married or maybe you have one or two kids, that is much easier to do. It's much easier to maintain your car, keep it clean and nice and shiny and vacuumed and spotless at all times. But when you have a large family, you're going on four or five, six kids. It is hard as hell to keep your car <laughs> clean because you will clean it. And literally the next day, it will look like someone dumped the trash in your car. <laughs> I felt that way with two kids. Yeah. So. so most of the time, it feels like you're just driving mm -hmm. a dumpster around and it sucks. And I hate it personally. And it drives me nuts. Because you want it to be super clean. I want my vehicle to be spotless. I want my mm. home to be spotless. But with kids, that's a, that's just a damn near impossibility. So yeah, it is. It's it's like on one hand, I don't want to settle for that. On the other hand, I can't put expectations on myself or my vehicle to be, or even my home at all times to be this this super spotless place mm -hmm. or vehicle. It's just the way it is. So you bring up a good point about the home too, though. I think sometimes people expect us to have a very messy home because we yeah. have so many kids, and we don't. No. But we've gone very minimalist too. We so. have. And so we could touch on that for a minute. Yes. The more children we have, the more minimalist, <laughs> minimalist and minimalist yeah. we've become because just can't keep track of and clean up so much stuff. There's no nice way to say that when you have eight people and a dog living in a home. And so the less things we have, the less clutter we have, obviously the way easier it is for our rooms and our home to stay picked up 
up and, and cleaned and we can stay on top of it better. So we have way less things than probably many families have mm-hmm. because, and we have things. So we like everyone has nice furniture and beds and we recently changed out our furniture and some things like that in our home. But the amount of like toys and clothes and clutter and excess we do not have that. No, as far as all that goes, I, I mean, I would venture to say we have as much now with six kids as we did when we had one. Yes. And so if you look at it, it's like we have more slide, beds now. Yeah, it's almost like if you look at a sliding scale or That's bar graph, true. it would show that overall per kid we mm-hmm. have far less things on average. That's than true. We did with just the oldest. I, yeah, I would agree with that, or the oldest too. I yeah. would definitely agree with that. We just are not as attached to things, and I didn't read. I know there's books about minimalism, and I'm sure they're great, but I couldn't make it a complicated process. I watched the minimalist documentary on Netflix and then just started clearing out my rooms. And if I haven't worn something in a year, I toss it. If something is stained or ripped and we're not going to fix it, I toss it. If it's something the kids aren't wearing or playing with and it's nice, we don't need it. We have less of an attachment of things because I have an attachment to seven human beings. Yeah. And that, that's my number one attachment is to the self-care and love of myself and to the seven people in my family and anything past that it's just stuff so my attachment is on people relationships nature you know enjoyment experience and not on things necessarily and our oldest who's 14 is hardcore minimalist she helps us a lot with that yeah, she does. She's actually a really big help. With I've all actually that. asked her, can you go into this room and do your minimalist thing with it? And she's like, no problem. Do I have free reign? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. And she will. And she knocks it out. And you'll think, oh, I really need that pillow. I really need that. And then once she removes it or we remove it, it's like, oh, gosh, that just opened that space up so much more. And it's one less thing cluttering the space. It also helps with anxiety and oh, depression yeah. and things like that. Opening up the windows, getting more stuff out of your space, decluttering your space declutters your mind. That's one thing that's helped us a lot. Having a large family is becoming more minimalist. Another thing that helps a lot is we all pitch in and we stay on top of that on a day-to-day basis. So for example, after our meals, especially lunch and dinner, everyone gets a job. So one kid will get dishes, one kid will get counters, one kid will get table and chairs, one kid will get sweeping, one kid might get picking out clothes for the youngest to, so we can start getting her ready for bed. Or if a room needs to be picked up, you know, like the family room or vacuuming that. And when you do that after lunch and after dinner, that really helps keep the space that you most of you were in most of the day picked up because it is super easy for a kitchen to all of a sudden just the counters to be covered if you don't stay on top of it. And we have check-ins throughout the day. If I start feeling a clean kitchen is everything to me. It makes me happy lowers my anxiety. I just feel a sense of peace and calm when I have a clean kitchen. So if I feel like it's getting really, really messy, I'll clean it up or I'll ask the kids to help me and we clean it up. And it doesn't take that long, you guys. We can all go into the kitchen and everything is cleaned within five minutes. It's awesome. So, and this is just a trick we started doing maybe a year or two ago is giving everyone one specific small job after a meal. And it has helped tremendously. Wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one other thing too is we do this a lot when, and we had to do it a lot this past week when we were moving. Um, but when we go out to eat as a family, yes. we, we don't do it that much because let's be honest, when you have multiple kids, it's pretty tough to go out and, and eat. A, it can be stressful because you don't know if one of the younger ones are going to have a meltdown. Yeah. And B, it is expensive. It is expensive. It is incredibly expensive. Inflation is real yeah. for sure. Yeah. It really, <laughs> really is. So when we go out to eat. But when we, yeah. When we go out to eat, one thing that we do is we look at the menu first. Mm-hmm. We look at what they got and we either. discuss it. Yeah. We'll discuss it and either we'll call ahead or when we get there, our system is I'll sit down with the kids. I'll get them seated and everyone kind of settle down and you'll go up and order. Mm-hmm. Or if we're being served, then you'll order for everyone mm-hmm. having already previously looked at the menu. The servers love it. Yeah, and and every single they're time they're shocked. They're shocked because they don't expect a family <laughs> of eight 
to be <laughs> that put together to know what it is that they want. You can like see it in their face. Like they're walking up to this family of eight and six are kids and many of them are young and they're like, oh crap, here we go. They're and I'm pale, they're sweating. <laughs> and they walk and there's people aren't going to tip me well. All right. And they walk up tip me like two bucks. <laughs> and they walk up and I'm like, okay, so I got this. Are you ready? And then I just boom, 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 boom. And we ask questions as we go. If there's certain questions and all the kids, they know this. And so they just, they, they pipe up. Up. They, you know, answer the questions and everyone's ordered. And we did this recently at the Spiral Diner in Fort Worth. And the server was like, that was incredible. He's yeah. like, I was not expecting that. And then we all sat there and we had a blast. Yeah. Like we were like our kids like to break out in song and dance and not in an obnoxious way, but in a really cute way. And we just had a great time when we all talked and we had fun. Really, these moments of this is why I had so many children. This is why I wanted a big family for moments like this. And on that particular occasion, there was a grown mom and daughter sitting in a booth next to our table. And Beard Baby, who's now three, kept getting up to dance the second part of our meal. And she would just kind of dance right there by the table. And she got kind of close to the booth. And I said, you know, oh, I'm sorry, you know. And they said, oh, no, it's no problem. And the, the mom shared stories of her daughter. And the daughter said, I'm so jealous. This is amazing like all the siblings just playing together and like singing and dancing like you guys are such a fun family and as a mom and dad of a large family it just makes you feel so good when you hear that and when people see that yeah it it, it actually did make me feel better that particular time because I was stressing out just a bit because it is a busy place and our kids were being loud and just there was a lot going on and so you know I'm trying to keep my mind focused on one thing at a time with all this mindfulness I'm doing and meditation but that that was a little harder that did help to hear okay well I guess my kids are the server loved pretty us. Pretty awesome right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah that, so that was when great. we when we go into a restaurant or we go out to eat or we go anywhere with our kids, we're very clear with them about what we expect. Like yeah. we expect you to use manners. We expect you to reflect well of us. We expect you to have be yourself and have fun, but at the same time, please respect us because we respect you. And if we respect you as our children and human beings, we expect you to respect us back. That really gets through to them most of the time. It really, really does. And then if they're actually acting up or something happens or they're let's say two of them start arguing with each other it can be like uh excuse me do you remember what we talked about and you know how do you think this is making your sister feel and how do you think it's making me feel and they're like oh okay instead of just snapping at them to stop not saying I ever snap at my kids but we do like to lay out the expectations for them before we go into somewhere public so that way everyone's on the same page but when we went to Chipotle the other day you sat everyone down we came in sat down and I went up and ordered and I just bam 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 knocked it out and the guys behind the counter were like, oh my gosh, ma'am, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, can you tell I've done this a few times? And so what I think happens is people expect it to be chaotic. But if I've been doing this for a while and I've learned from experience, then that's going to show I'm going to be experienced in this. I know what yeah. I'm doing. You know, if I only was, a, if I was a mom of one child and all of a sudden I had five other children to take care of, I might not be that efficient, you know, unless it was just my personality, which is not <laughs> So, you know, uh, they said, gosh, that would have taken somebody else way longer. I'm like, well, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, And then it helps reduce our stress and we can just enjoy the meal and the time with our children. And that is one of the luxuries of technology is now that you can look at menus online. Right. And you can prep uh, mm-hmm. if you do want to go out with your family. Right. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, that that uh, large family stereotype might fit oh, a yeah. lot of times when you That's go out to dinner. That's a good point. So that, mm-hmm. that is a good example there. One thing with the kids, when we do go out once in a while, if they're getting a little crazy in the car, I do have to remind them, hey, I don't want you guys embarrassing me in there. And they say, okay, okay. <laughs> and then I say, what happens when you when you embarrass me? And they're like, oh, you get mad? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, so you're going to embarrass me? <laughs> no. And so if they start getting a little embarrassing at one point, I'll just call their name and I'll look at them, just give them the death stare. And they're like, <laughs> they kind of cower. You must be doing this when I'm not looking because I don't know what you're talking about right now. <laughs> I, I do it a few times. I haven't had to do it recently. They've yeah. Been a lot they're getting recently. older. Oh, that's, that's another, what it is. That's another thing too is, you know, we're not going out with only like four kids, like six and under or seven and under, you know, our younger two are, are pretty young, but our older four are eaten up. And so even, even our younger two, one of them is seven, he just acts a little bit younger than his age. So, you know, our, we are, the kids are getting older and that does make a difference. It really does. 
Yeah, it's great. So yeah, yeah. I'm not embarrassed too often when we go mm-hmm. out. No, that's no. great. One other point I want to bring up as well is when you have a large family, that's the the main priority, right? Your spouse and your kids are the main priority. A lot of times, extended family will want to get together. They'll either want to come over, or they'll want you to go over to their place, or go out to eat, or mm-hmm. do this or that, or friends, or uh, if you're involved with your church, maybe there's church functions, or they may ask you to help out with something at church. It is okay to say no. Right. Absolutely. The the one word that I think that parents of large families need to learn is the word no. Because you have to protect your sanity. Uh, I, I know when, when we were in, in the Mormon church, and this is not a knock, it's just when you see families of lots of kids, they're at their limit. They're just bogged down and... We've been there and saying no is okay. You have to protect your your space, protect your family and your sanity. I think that that comes up a lot with probably church and family, like extended family. It's hard to say no when you're asked to do something and then you're worried about what they'll think or what will be said. And this is why having either a husband or a partner in the family that is a little bit more logical or uh, less emotional about these kind of situations is good because they can say, hey, it's okay to say no. And no is a full sentence. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So I think that that's a really good um, uh, point is that I, I have a friend who became a midwife and she, I think, has four kids. I haven't talked to her in a long time, but she has four kids, I want to say. And when she became a midwife, you know, she started realizing she needed more self care and she needed to protect her space more. And so she started saying no to everything that didn't have to do with her family because she was always on call and at birth and then her family, you know, and she was, she couldn't say yes to friends anymore, you know, or church or things like that. And that's okay. It is okay to choose you and choose your family. And then, you know, when you're taking care of yourself and you're filling up your cup more and you're finding a good ebb and flow and efficiency with your own family, then you can start saying yes more again. I think that's a really, really good point that you bring up. And Well, and, and both spouses need to be on, on point with this too because mm-hmm. I have personally seen there are some instances where one spouse is more prone to saying yes to everything and the other is not and it can, it can cause a rift. Right. You know, in your relationship. And so you both have to be on point. And when you're a parent, you're sleep deprived often. Uh, You're frustrated often because especially if you have little kids, little kids are hard. Right. Uh, There's a lot going on. And so going over to family's house across town or for the weekend, that that could be really hard or saying yes to a church calling that it may be the worst thing you could do for your family. So you, you have to put your, your, your marriage and your kids first in that situation. If you Absolutely. Have a big family. Yeah. Even in you, you've been really reading a lot and studying a lot on Buddhism and you were telling me even in Buddhism, they taught, which is a very giving philosophy, mm-hmm. very gentle and service and and whatnot but you were saying that even in buddhism there is the thought of protecting yourself and your livelihood as well you know like you you can't keep giving if you're not giving to yourself i mean we talk about this all the time when it comes to self-care so really this is a self-care of family right this is family self-care so there's that's part of the eightfold path uh, that that makes up the fourth mm-hmm. of the noble truths of the right livelihood. So, yeah, yeah, I don't I know mean, what you're talking about, but that sounds that's cool. That's in Buddhism. <laughs> Somebody asked what they, uh, I asked people on social media today if there was anything they wanted us to cover. Okay. And somebody asked, you know, what do we do when you get tons, billions and billions of and comments billions and, and comments when people are like gawking when you go out with your kids. And I used to get comments a lot when I had three and four children of, oh my gosh, you have your hands full or, oh, you know what causes that? And I would comment back with, yes, my hands are full with lots of blessings and just walk away. Or if people say, do you know what causes that? Yes. And obviously my husband and I are very good at it. Enjoy it. Thank you. You know, just walk away. Once I got to five and six kids, people don't say anything. I think they just take on the shock and stare. They do. They, they it's are a shock, shock and stare. Yeah. Shock and awe. Shock and awe. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're staring. And then once they yeah. see their kids are good and that we got together mm-hmm. as parents, they come up to us afterwards like, wow, your kids are Some really well behaved. Do. You seem like really good parents. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you perceived it all in about 10 seconds. Right. And well, <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm glad you figured out who I am in and that 10 th- seconds. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for putting your expectation on me that it's only okay if I have yeah. six kids if they're all well behaved yeah, too. Yeah, that that yeah. irks me because, yeah. you know, they're human beings. They don't have to always be well behaved. They're kids and they're human. But yeah, it's a lot of shock and awe and staring is what we get a lot. And mm-hmm. I also think we put off a vibe of don't even. 
yeah. at this point. Yeah. You know, like there was, if somebody is looking at me or like they're going to say something or if somebody starts getting rude, it's like, oh, honey, today's not the day and I'm not the one. But it's not even a door you get to open. <laughs> well, and then also too, I think with my beard and I have a full sleeve of tattoos, <laughs> I think I look a little more so? unapproachable now than I did when I was a clean cut Mormon. That's so, so funny. <laughs> yeah, that, maybe that's part of it. Because no one says anything to me about my kids. No, nobody says. Well, we I think women get the comments the most, to be honest. Well, not even you get it. Not, no, I don't. Mm -mm. I, I'm telling you, it's the vibe I'm putting <laughs> off. Like, I put off a very kindness and loving vibe. I mean, I, I smile and I'm super kind when I'm out or I'm at the store or whatnot. And I think that when you're putting out that vibe, you get that in return as well. But then there's, when it comes to my kids, it's like, I'm just mama bear. Like, don't make comments about that. So yeah, yeah. somebody put a really good tip on this thread on Instagram that putting clothes in the dirty clothes basket, shoes in the shoe basket and dishes in the sink and helping feed animals are tasks that uh, they've worked on mastering with their three-year-old. So you can even give your little ones tasks that help out around the house that they don't mind doing. And then she said the rest, I'm just winging, crashing and burning and rising up again. I love that. That is pretty good. Yeah. Right. And that's okay. Yeah. Like you're doing better than you think you are. Yeah. You know, these expectations we put on ourselves are really intense sometimes. And we have an episode on that about shifting expectations, yeah. expectations and boundaries. And that's okay. So and then somebody also asked about minimalism and we touched on that a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. I, I will also, something else I'll do if I feel that the house is just, I don't know, getting cluttered or I'm feeling a little on edge. I'll tell all the kids, well, the older five, go find 10 things we can throw away or donate. Yeah. And that's 50 things. Even if some of them are small pieces of trash or a broken hanger or, or what whatnot, probably about once a week, go mm -hmm. find 10 things each that we can throw away or donate right now, yeah. small or big. I don't care. And sometimes if we've been really on top of it, they're like, I can't find 10 things. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're doing good. We're doing good. That's another, another tip. That was one thing that was great about moving is getting to throw away mm -hmm. so much crap. Right. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, yeah, moving or changing rooms around helps with that a lot. Yeah. Somebody asked about bedtime. We have an, uh, an episode on bedtime, so you can go listen to that one if you're yeah, curious it's a recent about one too. bedtime. Yes. And somebody else asked about homeschooling, and we have another episode on homeschooling. We do. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about cooking? Efficiency, cooking. large family efficiency with cooking. Um, just have one of the kids do it. No, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Sometimes the kids do like to because they want to eat something. Like they really want chips. So my t our 12-year-old will say, hey, can I do lunch? I'm like, sure. And it's because he wants to get out that bag of salt and vinegar chips and have chips. But he'll throw together some sandwiches and some chips and, and do lunch while we're sitting right there working or, or whatnot. Or if he really wants garlic bread, he'll ask. It's I guess it's mostly him. He'll mm -hmm. ask if he can make dinner because he wants to make garlic bread with pasta. You know. Yeah, so yeah. the kids will help out with that. But... We keep it simple. Uh, we really keep it simple with meals. I, I don't try to make gourmet meals. We, we keep it simple. And a lot of times we'll eat quite a few of the same meals a lot in a week or two. And then we're like, okay, we need to eat something different. I, uh, we have a rice cooker. We do a lot of rice. And a rice cooker is your best friend. And it keeps the rice good for a day or two as well in there. Another thing we do too is when we do prepare meals, I will prepare our meal. That is true. That's recent. And you prepare the kids' meals. Mm -hmm. Because I hate preparing their meal because they, mm -hmm. they piss and moan about everything. But you and I like the same stuff. We have more dietary generally. restrictions right now with yeah, my true. gallbladder and like with you, with, you know, your bodybuilding and gluten sensitivities and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, so um, sometimes the kids will want things that you and I aren't eating and we have in the house for them. And so that's that's what you're referring to yeah, is yeah. you'll make something for us like a juice and something low fat or whatnot. And then. I'll put together something a little bit tastier and higher fat yeah. and whatnot for the kids. So well, that is true. That and is then, true. And then also too, the family meals are great, but a lot of times family meals can be frustrating when you have that big of a family. That's true. Because everyone's trying to talk over each other and That's it just gets true. a little crazy. So sometimes mm -hmm. what we'll do is the kids will eat and we'll be right there. We'll be in the kitchen or there in the you know off the kitchen by the dining mm -hmm. room, and we're, we're all there as a family. So right. it's not like we're not together. But the kids can sit down and eat. And then when they're done, they do all their jobs and then go off, do whatever they do after dinner. And then we can eat. And then it's a little bit smoother meal True. for us. True. So that's something maybe to consider. Basically, again, shifting those expectations and stereotypes. Not everyone has to sit down at the exact same time. If I'm serving the kids dinner, I might be up and down, up and down. That is actually better that way. They're doing their jobs and clean up that I'm, then I sit down and eat. But the, here's the thing. We're all still hanging out and talking in the kitchen. Yeah. 
You know, we're still spending time together as a family, even if we're not sitting down at the same time. And then you're getting to eat what you want and you feel good because you're helping take care of me because it feels good to take care of your your partner, and your spouse. Yeah, and I feel good because I'm taking care of my kids and then I'm getting taken care of because you're making me something nutritious to eat. So everyone's getting taken care of. Everyone's feeling good. Everyone's talking. Everyone's hanging out. It just might look a little bit different than your stereotypical recent sitcom. I don't know. Isn't that kind of the stereotypical mm -hmm. way it is with marriages and kids? The, the guy is always worried about the, the wife more and the wife is mm. worried about the kids more. Yeah. So make it work. <laughs> make it work for you, right? Yeah. And make, so we use that to our advantage. Yeah. Make it work for, for sure. you. I think that that's definitely fine. Something else, another tip, if you can afford it, is grocery pickup. Either you can order in at your local grocery store and pick it up curbside or Amazon Prime now does groceries in some areas. So if you can make technology your assistant in an affordable way, do it. Yeah, I love grocery pickup and delivery. It is one of my favorite things to do if I can. I really do. Here's a cute tip to someone put laundry every morning. That way I don't loathe doing it. And it's just part of my routine in the morning. My kids put their clean laundry into their own baskets. They don't even fold it and just keep the kids clean clothes on the stairs in their own clean bins. So, you know, finding a different way to handle laundry, clean bins, and, you know, everyone pitching in a little bit, making it part of your routine in a way that you don't dread it all day. And we're just sharing some things that we have found that works for us. It may not work for you, or it may just get your mind going and thinking about an idea like, oh yeah, I could do this or I could do that a little differently. Because sometimes when you're in your day to day, you get a little stuck and you feel like this isn't working, but you don't know how to get unstuck. And just hearing a suggestion from someone or just seeing how someone else does it, like, oh, I never even thought about that, you know, and it can help you out. And that happens to us all the time, you oh, know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that is that everything on my I have a that mind, is everything on your list. Awesome. Yes. I have yep. a mindfulness notebook and I, I that's an okay, speaking of efficiency, having six children and being a working mom and working parents, I was not keeping lists and I I can't even tell you how silly that is and I don't know why and it was making me constantly trying to remember things I had to get done and all that caused was stress and now I keep a notebook one way or the other and I write an ongoing list and you guys this is not a to-do list for the day because that's just stressful in itself because there's no way everything on my list I can get done in one day so it's an ongoing list of oh yeah that needs to be done on Tuesday oh yeah I need to make an eye appointment for this kid or oh I need to order these things next time I do an order on Amazon and these are the emails I need to answer and this is what I need to post on social media this week and on and on and on and now I have an ongoing list and then at night I check off the things I got done and I rewrite the list all over again and add in the things I thought of that day I need to do for the next day or the week and it is just life-changing organizational it's not a big deal it's a little notebook I have an ongoing grocery list we always have an ongoing grocery list anyways yeah. and I get tired and I can't remember that we need nutritional yeast <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the worst thing ever is when you go to the store and you get home and there's that one thing you really needed and you forgot it. So just keep a, and I keep it at my bedside table. So it's there at night or in the morning if I remember something. And then I keep it on the counter or in my purse during the day. And I just have an ongoing list now. So yeah, that's really helped me a lot. So we talked about everything on my list. If you want to read a few more tips or comments, you can go to my post on my January Harshi Instagram. There's one going right now, and I'll probably do another one when this goes live. So you can go and, and look at that. I think that's everything that was on my mind. I think that's it. Yeah. And then real quick, for those of you that are still listening, this next week, I will be in Dallas for the first How to Do Yubu seminar. If you want more details or a discount code on that or the other three in Minneapolis, Philly, and Detroit, send me a DM on Instagram or email me. And in two weeks is the postpartum webinar. We've changed the date and I'll be posting more about that. Sounds awesome. All right. So we hope you get some good tips and solidarity from this. And until next time, love you. Adios. Adios.